Um, the College of Education here at the University of Illinois has offered an extraordinary opportunity to explore what it means to be a higher education scholar um, in conducting meaningful research that will hopefully lead to transformation for our students and their families, as well as the field of higher education as a whole. And I'm inspired to share kernels of wisdom gathered through my lived experience as a higher education scholar and as one who has directly and indirectly benefited from research that has offered its focus of inquiry to specific communities with which I identify. And the story I wish to share with you today is of those who have made the journey to and through higher education, uh, those who were prevented from moving forward, and those who have helped us along the way. This is the story of the ways that we have struggled to find our place in higher education, and the story of the ways that we took over those spaces and made them our own. I'd like to begin with a meditation by uh, Luis Valdez. Tú eres mi otro yo. You are my other me. Si te hago daño a ti, if I do harm to you, me hago daño a mí mismo. I do harm to myself. Si te amo y respeto, if I love and respect you, me amo y respeto yo. I love and respect myself. And what this meditation means for me is that I am because you are. And I am because you can be. And I am because you need to be. I am la profesora, la jefa, la sobreviviente. I am a daughter, a sister, a sorority sister, a godmother. I am a friend who is like family. I am a colleague and a homegirl. I am from, oh, she is a smart girl, to how do you know what that word means? And you're so light, you can pass this white. I am from tears shed as my family left my college room to return 500 miles away to El Paso to tears shed as my family left, my, left me in my grad school room in Ohio to return 1,600 miles away, to tears shed as my family left me in my house in Georgia to return 1,400 miles away, to tears shed as my family left me in my house in Maryland to return 1,900 miles away. But to return meant that they had to arrive in the first place. I am from I mi hija, the college student, and I mi hija, the grad student, and I mi hija, the militant, when I received my doctorate at Arizona. This is a picture of my defense. I had 25 people who were able to celebrate in helping me achieve that, um, that degree. Stories for me are what keep us, from, um, keep us going in times of difficulty. They are what make us laugh. They inspire us, they validate our lived experiences. For me, stories were always shared around the kitchen table to remind me that I was something greater, um, that much was expected of me. Stories are what led to my work as a qualitative researcher, as someone who is always wanting to understand how people make meaning of what they experience in their lives, especially about how they travel through systems that are not built for them, systems that are not meant to sustain them, Systems that focus on weeding them out. My work is really about me, about how I, as a first-generation college student, a Chicana scholar, perseveres when others may have faltered, about those who invested in me, about why I am situated within this access of privilege and subjugation. From my conversations in academia, I feel a tension between trying to fit in and trying to rise up on our own. So do we use the master's tools to build our future or do we create our own? Is there a middle ground so that we who are so adept at being bicultural can navigate between multiple worlds, retaining what has nurtured us while learning how to play the game? My argument is that it is a responsibility of educational systems along the P20 pipeline to not only teach under-resourced communities and families that hidden curriculum that I'll talk about in a little bit, but also to value the cultural capital that is cultivated within Latino communities. Our culture counts. Our culture has capital. And this is not just about understanding the rules of the game, but transforming the game itself. I bear witness to, why do you want to leave us? And please don't go. And you have to go. And go on, girl. I bear witness to the deep institutionalized oppression that fragments all of us, that denies me the opportunity to live out all of my identities simultaneously, 
To only be seen as a professor is not enough. To only be a number that someone can check off to demonstrate that diversity is alive and well is not enough. I am more than that, and you are more than that. Here you see there's uh, several works that I'm going to talk about today. All of them were drawn from one uh, data source, the lived experiences of 33 Mexican-American PhDs. And we'll get to have an opportunity to see how they journey through, how the lessons that they learned in childhood inevitably informed who they are now as faculty. Unfortunately, the reality is that what you, um, what we want to believe isn't always what we see play out on the educational pipeline. And so if you take a look at this slide, you can see how various racial ethnic groups fare along the road to the doctorate. And so um, out of, you know, 100 students, and um, on the left is uh, women and on the right are men, um, that out of 100 elementary school students, only 63 Latino, Latinas will graduate from high school and 60 uh, Latino males. Right? And out of that, only 13 will actually graduate from college. And out of that, only three men will go on to graduate school. And then like 0.3 will actually earn their degrees, their doctorates. Here in the state of Illinois, I know that there are 22% of Latinos in the entire state who are uh, represented in K-12 education. Here at the University of Illinois, we only represent 7% of them. So there's some challenges that we're facing. In this state and in many states, as we see a larger representation of Latinos in K-12, and yet they're somehow not getting into uh, the pipeline. And when we look across subgroups, um, this is even more evident that certain communities are able to access higher education, but not by much. And so often what happens is we blame it on the individual and their families about whether they um, have the knowledge and that they lack knowledge right, of being able to go to college um, and that they are in fact at fault for what is happening in, in our communities. And certainly we can help at the individual level. I'm not saying that we can't. But I argue that we don't necessarily hold accountable the very institutions that are contributing to the clogs in this pipeline. That in fact, educational systems are doing their job. They're weeding out our talent. Um, and for those of us who work in higher education, we inevitably become complicit in helping institutions do just that. And I think about that a lot when I'm doing graduate school admissions. We always talk about fit, yet um, help a faculty member actually define what fit means. I don't know if we can. So one of the things that I think about a lot is I, as I was reading through the literature um, throughout my doctoral journey and even when I started thinking about going into the doctorate, I was reading work that didn't really reflect me. And it didn't reflect me in several different ways because I came from a military family. My dad is retired Air Force. So we moved around a lot but I was educated in Department of Defense schools, which happened to have a much stronger curriculum than we often see in public education. And then I also kind of lived what could be construed as a middle-class life, even though I was still a first-generation college student and was having to navigate college on my own. So there were a lot of complexities that I didn't necessarily see depicted in what is often seen as kind of a deficit model about Latino communities, that we don't value education, that we don't have a certain number of books in our homes and in our libraries. And so that must be the reason why we're not able to succeed. And so as I started to read, I started to think more about, well, what is it that I believe in? What is it that um, is, is driving me to do the kind of work that I want to do? So for many of you grad students, we're going to talk a little bit about epistemology. Now, I don't have a lot of time, so <laughs> I spend a lot of time with my students in the qualitative research methods class thinking about this. But one of the things I, I'm always asking is what is truth, right? And whose knowledge is valued? And so um, this is helping me think about, for me, I really wanted to see more of my lived experience, my truth, knowing that my truth was different from other Latinos and Latinas uh, and Latinx communities. Um, but that, to think about the complexities of my lived experience, and I wasn't finding that in the scholarship. 
So I started reading more about epistemology and trying to figure out, well, what do I value? What do I believe is truth? And I really think that no matter where you are along the spectrum and the kind of work that you want to do, if you're a quantitative or a qualitative or a mixed method scholar, that inevitably it's really reflecting what you value, whose truth you, you value, how we construct truth. Um, and so this is an important baseline to any research design. So I like to use the example of a tree. So please just go with it, OK? OK. So this is what I think about is post-positivism, right? So truth is just there. It has nothing to do with us. We don't interact with the truth. It's, it's meant to be known and uncovered. And it's meant to be done in a very distant, objective way. And so often scholars will try to do this, this kind of arm's reach approach to their work. Um, and so an example of the tree would be that we think of a tree as this, you know, producing photosynthesis. And that, you know, they take in the carbon dioxide and they go through a series of procedures to create oxygen. We learned this in elementary school, hopefully. Um, and so this is fine. I mean, this is how some scholars want to look at, at the tree. That just this whole work is to do photosynthesis and we can draw, you know, I can know how they do it. I can create all the uh, beautiful diagrams about it and leave it at that. Now, I know it's a, we're, we're simplifying here. We're simplifying here. But as a constructivist, I really believe that there are, I, I'm, I'm negotiating and, uh, and navigating and working with others to create my truth, to create the reality in which I live in. And so an example of this is the tree as the giving tree. Um, ha, how many people have actually read the giving tree? Most people, right? All right, you often get this like in college, like when you graduate from college for some reason. But, but basically, the whole story of the giving tree is, is this notion that the tree and the child are working together, they're growing together, and they're creating the reality for that child. So at one point, the tree is giving it food, its nourishment, um, its shelter, its protection. Um, at some point, the, a young boy decides to chop it down right, and build a boat. Um, and eventually, they grow old together, and, and the tree is still willing to give. And, it gives enough that it leaves, I mean, it's stump for the old man to sit down and have a place to rest, right? So it's always giving. Um, and so the reality is constructed between those two people. And so that's how I believe, and I, and I work on this in my classes about, I have as much to gain from you as you do from me, that we co-construct the knowledge together, that there's always opportunities to learn and engage, but that there's also power structures at play that I need to attend to. And I think that that's one of the things that I, my distance from my work really starts to get smaller and smaller because I acknowledge that I'm complicit in some of the reproduction of power structures right, in our society through my various aspects of privilege, um, but that I'm also resistant to some of them. Right? And I want to call out the truth, and that's little t, truth. Now, some of our postmodernist uh, subject, uh, subjectivists may I disagree with what I will depict next about what is a tree. But this is a tree. Because it's whatever you want it to be. We all have multiple truths. We all live multiple uh, experiences and realities. And so it doesn't always necessarily look at the power structures in place that tell me what is a tree. And that certain people have access to that knowledge and not everybody. So this is kind of how my epistemological worldview has come through. And you'll see it in a lot of the work that I'm doing. So that was a little bit of a, an overview of epistemology. So as I was thinking about my epistemology, I was also thinking about what conceptual frameworks, what theories really fall in line with what I believe is reality and truth. And so these are the three that really guide my work. And I want to make sure that I attend to acknowledging the people, the scholars who have come before me. I think that's an important part of what we do in our work is that you know, we're really um, part of the discourse about you know, what, what is it that you want to contribute to a conversation that's already happening. And so for me, I, I want to be able to talk about how Chicana feminists have informed my work and the way that I view the world, um, how critical race theorists have integrated their perspectives into what I believe, um, and then also how a model like community cultural wealth has helped me to really think about how we look at the assets that Latino communities bring with them. I also want to attend to the fact that 
there are other people outside of the, you know, the rigor, right, the, the rigorous discourse that's happening in the scholarly community that my family, my community has informed who I am as a scholar. And I have to, I have to acknowledge them as well. These are people who have invested in me. Um, these are people who um, that have a, a wealth of information that may not necessarily be found in any book, right, but that have really guided me to help me succeed and persevere. So to give you an overview of critical race theory, and we can certainly talk about this um, later and uh, during the um, coffee hour that's happening um, or the fireside chat. But you know, the work of Dan uh, Daniel Solorzano um, over at UCLA and many of the subsequent people that he has mentored has really, you know, have really helped me think about what is critical race theory specifically within educational research. Um, and helping me to figure out, well, what, what do we mean by the challenge to dominant ideology? This was a particular tenant of CRT that was challenging for me. I couldn't really figure out what does that really mean. Um, and it, more and more I started reading about, well, what are the dominant ideologies within our society that continue to drive us? And one very key example of that is the American dream. So this is the, the master narrative that's out there about if you just work hard enough and pull yourself up by your bootstraps that you can succeed. And that has infiltrated every aspect of our educational system and our society. Right? And I mean, it's prevalent now, this whole message of, of the, that the government does not need to be able to support people, that people should support themselves. And we know that there are some injustices and inequities that are happening in our society that keep people from being able to do that. People want to be able to do that. But that there are systems in place that are weeding them out, that are sorting them through, that keep them from being able to realize their full potential. So this really informed my notion of these master narratives. Where are they coming from? Because one of the things that we have to think back of, where did this American dream came from? It really came from these dime novels, the Horatio Elger myth, that of this young orphaned uh, boy who was supposedly right put of himself by his bootstraps. But not really, because he actually had a benefactor. And this benefactor invested in him enough to help him access the networks um, and the cultural capital that he needed to succeed. So whenever we're thinking about this kind of in, rugged individualism, that's not even happening even in the American dream master narrative. But they construct the realities in which we live in. Right? They legitimize specific power and positions. They, perpet they perpetuate the colonization of marginalized communities. And it's through the construction of the word. To be able to create such a um, a strong narrative that people remember it even hundreds of years from now, right? About our communities. And so no matter how much we try to dispel the notion that Mexican American parents value education, that's still a narrative that we are having to fight. Why are we having to fight that over and over again? Right? That this is, these are the realities. And so thinking about what are the counter narratives to help to dispel these, but then also empower our communities to think beyond these master narratives. Some of the challenges to critical race theory is that if we're only thinking about race, we're not thinking about how the other intersecting identities that we live in really will affect our lived experiences. So as a Chicana woman, right, and heterosexual, right, and um, middle class, and Christian, how all those intersections allow me some forms of privilege and also subjugate me. There's aspects of this that I'll talk about in one of my, um, in one of my work about getting an education in case he leaves you. This whole notion of the types of, of advice and consejos that are given to women specifically um, as they go through the educational system. Um, what I appreciate about Chicana feminism is again that the closeness to the data, you want it to be very close because you're living through, you're using your cultural intuition your lived experience, your professional experiences, the literature to really help inform what you see is happening in the lived experiences of others. And you're honoring subjectivities. You're thinking about all the ways in which people identify and trying to figure out how to best support them, right? And to acknowledge that some people have, um, this is not oppression of Olympics by any means, right? But that these interlocking systems of oppression do create specific realities for people. And so the way that we live out even uh, the same policy is going to be different um, based on our different intersecting identities. 
And then finally, this concept of cultural capital. Um, and, and many of us have talked about this, about what is privileged knowledge? Um, and Terry also is, is really thinking about this from a community cultural wealth standpoint. So we have certain forms of cultural capital that are valued more than others, right? But what she said is that, okay, cultural capital, yes, it's important. How to you know, navigate through college admissions processes is, is one of the best examples of, of how cultural capital works. But that, okay, if you don't have that, that doesn't automatically mean that you won't be able to access higher education. It's just that how do we harness other forms of capital that uh, may not necessarily be the same as cultural capital, as the privileged forms of cultural capital, um, but still give us some currency in being able to survive and thrive in higher education. So for example, aspirational capital is the ability to maintain hopes and dreams for the future, even in the face of real and, or perceived barriers. So the belief that our families have in us inevitably help us to keep going even in the midst of difficulty. Or linguistic capital of being able to understand different forms of language, and that goes from formal and informal. There's entire work that's being done about the work of graffiti artists, and that how that is a language and how that communicates a certain uh, you know, world view and experience, and that that is legitimate knowledge, right? But we often dismiss it. Navigational capital are the skills of being able to maneuver through social institutions. And for many Latino communities, especially um, when we're um, talking about linguistic brokers, when children are young, they're navigating between paying bills, um, talking with um, uh, businesses and uh, utility companies and banks, right? They're, they're translating for their families. Even to this day, my family will send me documents that I need to read to interpret because I'm the one with formal education. Um, and so these are the realities that, that we have, and how do we navigate that? Um, so that in itself is capital. Social capital. Um, and there's a lot of work about social capital, right? Access to networks and people and community resources. And often we think about social capital as the right networks. And certainly that is important to be able to access certain opportunities, but that there are social networks. Um, some examples are, um, the funding groups that are often used in immigrant communities where people pile money together and then um, are able to share the wealth to help support someone in realizing one of their dreams. I mean, this is the way that a social capital can work. Familial capital. Again, it's similar to aspirational capital. It's a notion that how you nurture familia um, can carry a sense of community history, memory, and cultural intuition. And I, I'd like to give a shout out to uh, my colleagues who, there's nine of us in that picture. Um, we presented at the National Association of Student Personnel Administrators um, way back in the day when I was in grad school. All of us, except for one, one had already earned his PhD, and the rest of us were doctoral students, and we presented on that experience. And it, maybe a couple of years ago, we were, we, the last person, Dr. Salmena, finished his degree and we celebrated uh, and presented there um, at NASPA again. Um, but that familia, we've carried with us, right? We've carried with us. You've got your um, sister scholars, your brother scholars. Those are important. And then there's also resistant capital, um, oppositional behavior that challenges inequality. And more and more, we're seeing a lot of resistant capital formulating um, across the nation. So one of the things that I think about, so, so certainly these are the different frameworks that uh, we consider, but I also think about doctoral education because I think this is an area that we need to continue to think about with our communities of color, right? So we know just in general that all doctoral students who start the, I'm sorry to say this, but half of them will not finish. And there's a variety of reasons why that's happening. Um, mostly it's institutional sorting mechanisms that are at play here. Program selectivity is the first step um, to keep people from being able to access our graduate programs. There's faculty perceptions about who is valued as a real scholar. Often independence is valued over interdependence. Um, com competition is valued over cooperation and collaboration. Um, and so not all communities want to be competitive. 
um, or need to be competitive in order to do good, rigorous work. And yet that's how we prime our students to be competitive. Um, and also, you know, to not rely on one another um, as, as cohorts. And it's also this whole socialization process. So who has access to being socialized to become faculty and the thought leaders that uh, we need to have in doctoral education? And so certain faculty, and we know this, right? Let's not be um, coy about this, that we do invest in certain students. We don't invest in everybody in the same way. And that becomes problematic when, when there are students who don't have access to the same kind of resources and social networks that we should be offering to everyone. But we just don't make time. And then time to degree. There are certain disciplines that take a shorter amount of time because there are opportunities that are set in, in place to help them. Often, if you are part of a laboratory, as an example, you are more likely to graduate earlier only because you have access to publishing opportunities. You can work your dissertation through that lab, on, depending on what the politics are in that lab. For people who are TAs, that's a lot harder because you're investing so much energy in teaching a class versus doing your own research. So these are the things that, even though it's a funding opportunity, can also be um, a distraction. So these are all the things that we think about when we're talking about how we get advanced Latinos into a doctoral program. So it's kind of a catch-22. We have limited numbers of Latinos going through the pipeline, which inevitably mean, means that we have less of them going into faculty positions, which means that there are less of them <laughs> to mentor and support Latino scholars, emerging scholars. Um, and I'm not saying that Latinos should be the only one um, or underrepresented minorities should be the only ones offering mentorship, because we know that there aren't a lot of us out there, um, especially at research extensive universities. Um, and so that's a lot of burden, um, some that we are willing to take on, right? But we also have to hold accountable our colleagues who are um, able to very quickly not volunteer for that kind of mentorship and support. There's also individual aspects, self-doubt, imposter syndrome, all of us go through this. So please, if you're feeling that way right now, know that we feel you, we understand. Many of us still go through imposter syndrome ourselves in the faculty. Um, but those of us who are able to succeed inevitably become um, what Cuadras talks about as the politics of exceptionality. That you must be really special if you've been able to finish your degree. And so you must not be like everybody else in your community, right? But that's often how we're depicted. Um, in addition to that, there's exploitation and marginalization. So we are utilized when it's convenient for our programs and our universities to utilize us, right? In a picture, right, on the website, um, or to be able to um, utilize our funding resources that, that we have, right? Um, but otherwise, often we get marginalized um, into, uh, into our own work, right? And our, and our work isn't necessarily valued. But... There are some aspects that really help us to maintain resilience um, and, and to persevere. Strong family support, self-efficacy, um, having high educational aspirations, resisting uh, some of the socialization that is occurring, um, to not always you know, drink the Kool-Aid on, um, on this notion of competition, right? That there are ways that we can, we can support one another, even if everyone, and this is a very good example. My sister scholar, Judy marquez Kiama. Um, this is um, us graduating from the University of Arizona. We graduate at the same time, both looking at um, faculty positions. And the message was that, oh, can't wait for this friendship to break up because they're going to be in competition for the same jobs. And we were, but we've supported each other with that. Um, and, and, but people are waiting to see that happen, right? Because for some reason, there's only one of us allowed in any department. Right, that's it, that's all we need. So looking at my dissertation specifically, um, I looked at 33 Mexican American PhDs. 25 were female, eight were male. Um, and most were poor, low income, working class, but I did have middle class um, participants in the study. They came from 15 different institutions and from a variety of disciplines. Most of them were faculty. 
So I want to just take you briefly through the three different areas um, to see what their experiences were along their journey as children um, all the way through to faculty life. And so for parental involvement, I really wanted to look at this notion of the master narrative that Latino families don't value education. Um, and so what I did find was that we were, in fact, reproducing some of that master narrative. Um, and this is the example from Nieves and his story about how his family really didn't want to support um, him going to a private school. And so um, he was having to walk uh, to school, take him miles to get to that school, um, even though he had a scholarship. And his mother kept saying, you know, you should just drop out because um, they're just going to try to milk us for all of our money. So it's one thing to get, uh, you know, free tuition, but it's another thing to, you know, you're going to have to, you know, raise money for them. Um, they're always going to ask us to be involved. And so he says, you know, she was not a PTA mom. She never wanted to go to the school at all. Um, she didn't want to know about parent-teacher conferences. And so we can certainly depict, and he did, he depicted his mom in a very particular way that she didn't value his educational development. And there are notes of truth in that, right? But I think we can see it from, if we were to see it from the mother's perspective, it's true. Like, it's not just the scholarship, but everything else that's involved when you're coming from a working family that doesn't have enough time to dedicate to coming to a school. If you're having to drive your child you know, five miles out of the way so that they can go to this private school instead of having a good education right down the street, you know, that, that's a lot of time and energy that a parent is having to use. So we can blame it completely on the parent, but also thinking about, well, what were the educational systems happening around the area that was keeping him from getting a quality education from where he was. From another stance, there was uh, Carlos and the sewing machine. And Carlos talks about how his family um, worked for a clothing factory. And they would bring tons of clothes to the house every day, and the children all had to work. They had to trim all of the threads that were coming out of the clothes that were being sewn. And so he hated this job. Um, but what he would do is he would come to school, he would come home, do his homework, have dinner, and then trim these threads. And he didn't want to do it anymore. And so his dad said, you know what, if you don't want to go to school, uh, or, and, you know, you don't want to do your homework, then you can go and, and, you know, I'll get you a job and you can work in the factory, if that's what you want to do. So what the message was, not only was, you know, like, you don't want to go to school, you're going to work. That's what you're going to do. Um, but this, this notion of you don't want to be like us. And, um, you know, for Carlos, he was very proud of his family. But his family didn't want, you know, his, his life to reflect theirs. He wanted, they wanted something better for him. Um, and so, you know, for him, he ended up going to uh, prestigious university on the West Coast um, and, and earned his degree. Um, but he always remembered that the importance of hard work and effort, and that that in itself is a form of capital, of being able to see that in your families. Okay, so these different lessons learned as, as children inevitably informed their graduate education. So as I mentioned already, this whole notion of institutional agents contributing to sorting mechanisms. So as an example, Teresa, um, had been pursuing a graduate degree, and um, you know they they told her you're not the right fit for us. Um, she had a learning disability, and there weren't a lot of resources available in that graduate program. So she felt very dismayed, um, but she still persevered and ended up going into a doctoral program that accepted her. And at one point, she went to a conference and did a presentation uh, that was well received. And that same faculty member who had rejected her had come over and said. I always believed that you could make it. Right? And she's like, but you never even told me to pursue a degree. Right? Yeah. Other people were uh, institutional agents as sponsors. So um, this one woman uh, was a teacher, um, K-12 education, and was reading up on some work from a scholar um, in her state. And she just contacted her and said, I'm wondering if you, we could talk a little bit about your research. And um, from that conversation, the faculty member actually recruited her into the doctoral program. 
um, and offered you know, funding resources for her. And she was really shocked by just taking the initiative to have a conversation and st establish a relationship with this woman that inevitably would lead to being able to be mentored by her. Um, and so, you know, Fernanda was like, you know, what do you, what do you mean you're gonna, I'm gonna pay for your school? Like, what have I done to deserve this? This whole notion of that, you know, we have to, um, that we don't have anything enough, we don't have enough to deserve the opportunities that we've been given. And some of this is humility and, and humbleness, but this certainly kind of is challenged in the socialization practices where people demand, I mean, we deserve to be here, right? That's not always what happens in Latino communities. Um, a lot of them also talked about the notion of the hustle and having to hustle in graduate school in order to persevere. Um, but not having a mentor really you know, costs a lot of money for folks to not even know what kind of doctoral programs they wanted to go to, into, how to apply for graduate school, those kinds of things. Um, and many of them also talked about spiritual faith, about how important that was and that reading signs helped them to think about going into graduate school. But persisting education, though, those are all the different, what I found was that there were a lot of forms of community cultural wealth that were coming through and being able to access graduate education. But being able to persist, actually, that, that participants still needed traditional forms of cultural capital in order to persist. They still needed to be mentored and socialized. They still needed to be able to publish with faculty. They still needed to go into all of the, the, um, the means of being able to get socialized to succeed in higher education. So again, they were reproducing these notions of individual determination. Um, and so Fernanda, for example, you know, as you, so, you know, as you recall, she was offered the opportunity. She's driving all the way to the school with her mom. And right as she's getting to the town, she makes a U-turn and starts driving back. And her mom is like, what is happening? And she's like, I cannot do this. This is too much. Like, I, I'm not that smart. This is, again, this whole notion of imposter syndrome. And her mother said, no, we, you're going to turn this again, and we're going to go. Um, and so having that kind of you know, familial capital, that aspirational capital, her mother believed enough in her, even when she didn't believe in herself. External fellowships ended up being so much of a lifesaver for many minority um, students because there is no investment from faculty in their home departments. So they had to find other ways to fund their education. And often external fellowships allow them to be able to get away from the politics that are happening in that department, um, as well as being able to access a larger social network. So uh, there was a woman, Darcy, she's, um, she didn't realize at the time, she was in sciences and did not realize at the time that um, she was being weeded out from a program where she was the un an undergrad. So she had been an undergrad and that was fine and then got accepted into the doctoral program and then they purposefully started to weed her out. Um, when she received a low grade in one of her courses. And so she had to have intervention occur with one of the vice presidents. Um, but she never wanted to see it as a minority issue. But more and more she started to think about it. She's like, well, I'm the only woman, and I'm the only woman of color here, so, or a person of color in this program. And so inevitably she ended up getting an NSF fellowship and was able to get away from um, faculty who were trying to keep her from being able to succeed. These are the challenges. So you have to dedicate time to even try to apply for external fellowships, right? Um, but it does play a role. And then again, navigating obstacles. So Fernanda, she has a lot of stories to tell about this. But one of the things that she started to realize that she mentored other Latinas was, you know, she would talk about if a white woman is struggling and she gives up, well, that's a white woman and that's it, right? But what you do for your community, lo que tú haces, like affects everybody. So you don't have a choice, you've got to finish, right? I mean, that's the reality of, so many of us are first generation, so many of us are doing, uh, are trying to do our work on behalf of our communities. So finally, okay, so we have these consejos, this advice for, you know, aspirational, familial capital that's happening, is navigational, they're, they're armed with all of this knowledge. And now they're trying to access graduate school. They're trying to become professors. And this is the advice that they're given. So one of the things I found with the 25 women that I um, interviewed was that education was really a liberation from men, but not from your family. 
So um, from, a, from as undergraduate or as they were aspiring to go to college, it was, you know, you need to get an education because if he leaves you, you, you don't have anything, right? So the mothers were often in really difficult and challenging relationships that kept, and because they didn't have education, they couldn't move away from that. They didn't want that for their daughters. Um, and the fathers didn't want that either. And I think some of that is like pr protecting their daughter's virtues is kind of what, uh, what education they felt would do for them. Um, but you know, the, this whole notion of you better you know, center your own feet without a man was a big message that was being said. And what they were observing is that the messages that the daughters were receiving was not necessarily what's happening in the home life. So even though her father, you know, Fernanda's father was uh, really helpful in, in helping to inspire her to pursue college, um, he wouldn't allow his wife to work outside the home. So these are the kind of complexities that we're talking about um, with the types of consejos that were being given. Now these women were cultivated and supported to pursue college. They were very successful and inevitably wanted to pursue graduate education because they've been very successful, right? So then education became a double-edged double sword. You are delaying family. Uh, you're gonna get too smart, you're gonna get yourself out of the dating scene, right? Out of the dating pool. Um, why, you know, it's okay to be educated, but like so ambitious? Like, do you really need to do that, right? Um, and so these are the challenges so that, for what I wanted to demonstrate is how, even in the same live course, how the messages can change, right? How inevitably, like, even your own family can, you know, can, can provide, you know, can hinder some of your own aspirations, right? But all of these lessons they learned and were, became very observant as they became faculty. So they were also advised as faculty that um, they were also fighting among, uh, with white women, uh, white faculty, to be able to gain resources and support from the white men who were in power in their departments. So they were recognizing that that was the game and they had to figure out how to do that. Uh, Yesenia did not do that very well. She was not interested in playing into anybody's ego. Um, and she didn't appreciate being told that, that she had to compliment these men who were in positions of power in order to gain the resources. But she also knew that that was important. She labeled herself as not as low feminine. This is how she portrayed herself and talking about gender performance. And this is one of the things that I started to notice is that a lot of the women in the sciences in particular were performing a specific form of gender that was much more masculine. Um, and part of that is because men would not take them seriously when they would go to conferences and into their labs. There was a great deal of sexual harassment that was occurring. So they wore less makeup, they wore pants, uh, very nondescript, um, wouldn't do anything with their hair um, in order to fit in better with their labs and at the conferences. But some women used um, high femininity to be able to get better teaching evaluations. So they wore skirts, um, they wore hosiery, they had makeup, but not too much jewelry, right? Um, so they had to kind of curb um, some of their own um, ways of expressing, right? In order to know that, that inevitably that this may affect their teaching evaluation. Um, so, and then finally, like Rachel notes that even within the Latino community, um, how women are subjugated through, you know, patriarchy and heterosexism, right? So, you know, that they could be at a conference where men are talking about, you know, these mujeristas and, you know, that, that we should, you know, empower women and all these things, but then not actually shut up and listen to a, what a real woman is saying at the conference. Um, that, that these men were always in, you know, trying to position themselves as being the only ones who had knowledge to share at these conferences. So these are the, the realities that um, many of the participants discuss. So that's a, a very brief overview of some of the work that I'm doing. And um, what I think a lot about when I'm doing any of my work is, you know, when I, I put on my regalia, you know, I'm reminded that not too long ago, people who look like me were denied opportunities to put on that role. And that there are disciplines and fields where people are still the first and the only, uh, but they will not be the last. My regalia, it serves as a yoke 
that I carry as I do my research and I advocate for social justice. And how do we as a higher education scholarly community treat this symbol? Will it become a living commitment to doing something of substance with your degrees? Um, will you take on the challenge of taking on the yoke to advocate for our communities, to shape the way that we go about our business, to rethink how we educate, how, how we enforce the law and practice medicine, how we add cultura to our, by our very presence. My hope for you, for us, is that we will take on the challenge of paving the way for others, of helping people to stand on our shoulders so others can also be reflections of their communities. I shoulder a load that I'm willing to take, although at a cost. At those greatest of times when I am unsure of where I'm going, when I fear what I'm doing is not enough, I think about those who came before me and I remember that the hands I used to type are the hands of those who toiled in the fields, on the streets, in the factories. They are the eyes that I use um, to uncover injustice, are the eyes who refuse to look down on the ground. The voice that I use is the voice of those who shouted against tyranny, against racism, and of those who whispered love in spite of it all. What it means to live in one nation when, we when our present situation denies so many of our people the opportunities to a good education, to equal opportunity, to quality of life, simply because they do not have the documentation to claim their fundamental human rights. When our present situation disregards and ignores the knowledge learned in the home, through stories shared around the kitchen table to the consejos, the dichos, the stories that inform many at an early age about the power of education. Certainly one can feel a bit downhearted about what is happening in our present world, but I am doing everything I can to be hopeful. My formal training has taught me to analyze what is, to present multiple truths in our world so that we have a deeper, multifaceted understanding of societal problems. I have been taught to analyze the past, to glean from the lessons that were learned from previous generations, to add greater meaning to what is present in our lives today. I, I want to believe that what I do in my work will lead to building bridges from K through 12 to graduate school to the professoriate rather than viewing them separately. That what I do in my work will inspire someone to enhance my ideas, to put our scholarly dreams into action. To think otherwise would mean that I and my colleagues are letting down the people in this room and people in our communities who are merely surviving by sheer will and determination. I know what it means to blaze a trail that no one has taken before. I know what it is to be the only one. I know what it means to have a student explain with great honesty and pain that you are the first person they have had as a teacher who looks like them, who perhaps understands them. And that is where my formal training fails me. When I begin to realize the fragmented lives that so many of us who enter higher education must live, to segment ourselves because who we are in the classroom has to be different for, than where we are at home. To prepare ourselves to know that our cultures and customs, our traditions and values are not only ignored and dismissed, but potentially vilified. My formal training, my education, it beckons me to see the world through a distant lens, to keep it an arm's length so I can approach a problem with objectivity. But my spirit, it calls me to engage, to immerse myself as a whole person so that my understanding of the world around us is enhanced with compassion and care. That lesson was learned even before I started school in the borderlands of El Paso. It was a lesson taught over and over at the kitchen table, the same stories told multiple times, but each time with a different emphasis, a different moral to be learned. My formal education taught me to theorize about life, but my edu uh, educación, it taught me how to live it that all of my achievements mattered very little if I didn't have respect for my family, my community, my ancestors, myself. I learned very quickly that my life was not my own, that there were dreams and aspirations carried on the backs of those who came before me so that I could stand proudly even in the midst of strife and difficulty, that I do not walk alone, that my life was a reflection of others who had lived and that my role was to honor that wisdom, that knowledge, the knowledge that cannot be found in any book but was found from being in communion with others until one day it would be my turn to tell the stories, my turn to inflect my wisdom of having lived, my turn to teach and learn. Mi gente, I cannot promise you that the pathway will be easy. What I can promise you is that I will be with you to validate your experiences, to lessen your fears, to push you forward. I am here because of you, and you will be because of me.